Hey, welcome to the 10th Prismatica devlog. It's pretty exciting one today. Um, Andrew isn't with us currently. He's been taking a little break. So if you do decide to comment on this video, make sure you send Andrew some love. I'm just going to be going over some of my recent additions and uh, experimentations. What is new in the land of Prismatica? Well, let's go this way. <laughs> I've been working on a component that can go on any skeletal mesh and essentially what it allows us to do is to draw damage permanently to any skeletal mesh that has this component enabled. So I'm just going to rough this guy up a little bit. Ooh, poor lad. So you can see, uh, he's, he's taken a little bit of damage here, you know, he's, he's got a sore head, his clothes are getting torn. He's uh, got a very bruised shin. Oh lord, what are you doing, lad? Okay, apparently he's not quite dead. Uh, you can see he's got a nasty cut on the back of his calf. Very gruesome. And it also draws blood uh, from wounds onto characters. So if I was to stand here and start getting, you know, showered on by this, this guy, um, <laughs> you can see that my character gets covered in his his blood. And another little addition to that is uh, dripping blood. So if we shoot him here, and you can see here there is blood dripping down his leg. And eventually when it gets to a point that's too steep, it will drop off onto the ground. So we can see it in action on this bigger mesh. You can see that these are always dripping downwards in world space. And the nice thing about this system is that all I have to do is put a component on the actor and it will just sort it all out for me. So by using a blueprint interface, if we get these blood spurts, which are active, um, if they hit anything, they'll do a little trace and they'll just send out a message regardless of, you know, whatever it hits, saying, hey, draw a blood splat here. And if the hit actor implements that blueprint interface, it will draw blood or draw damage or anything at the appropriate place. So the way that this works, and it is a variation of Ryan Brux's method of painting to a skeletal mesh using world space, we can specify a location in world space for a material to react to. So let's just say this is our, our world space, and let's say this is our actor right here. This is his head. Uh, this is a top-down view, by the way. If we were to say to this material at these coordinates, draw a circle like this then we would get a circle on this material in world space and you know that'd be the end of it so what happens is once these textures have been projected in world space the materials of the character get swapped to be this material which looks like this so you can see what's happening here is it's unwrapping the uvs of the character and because i have the world position set to exclude material offsets these world space positions here get moved along when it gets unwrapped. Then what happens is there's a scene capture that as part of the component gets spawned on begin play. That scene capture is inactive, so it isn't ticking, it isn't taking any shots. But then when we want to draw something to a character's damage mask, it will take a shot of this and only this. It can only see the actor. And then it draws it to a damage mask. So if we have a look here in this little corner, and we disable the red and the green channels. This is the blue channel, which I use for permanent injuries and stuff. Then the R and the G channels I use to create a normal map so that we can get bumps and stuff where, you know, things get hit. So we can make dints in armor, we can make cuts seem deeper. And then the alpha channel is used for blood that is on the surface of the character. And the cool thing about using this render target method is that we can make different materials react differently to the same texture. There is dints on the armor, so that's just the normal map in action. And then you can see on this guy's leg, it tears a hole in the cloth. And then on just like skin or something or flesh, we can do things like, you know, deform the mesh inwards so it looks like, you know, a bit's been gouged out of him or something. And so just for a little example of how easy this is to implement, I'm going to delete the damage mask component that's on the, the blueprint humanoid guy, uh, my, my prototype humanoid. So you can see that nothing's happening, nothing's getting drawn to us. 
you know, we're, we're getting dealt damage, but he's not actually drawing any blood. And then if I was to go into the humanoid and go add component, damage mask component, that's there now, compile. And now, by doing that one simple step, we are now bleeding, we're now getting drawn on. Oh god, that was a nasty hit. Bastard. Oh, ow. He's uh, getting a few hits in on us. Oh, get wrecked, idiot. Oh, nice dodge. Come on, mate. Oh, he's out of stamina. Better go in for the kill. Huh? Oh. There we go. I think he's down. Yeah, he might be dead. So if we go down and check out the damage we've done. Yep, there you go. Doesn't really have a face left. I mean, he never had one to begin with, honestly. So you might be wondering, hey, Charlie, are you just a sicko or is there some sort of point to all this? And the point to this is readability. Because our game is more sort of realistic in terms of the, the combat and the damage and stuff, we want players to know that, you know, hey, you just hit this person in the head or hey, you just hit this person in the leg. Therefore, you know, they're going to be injured and moving slower. And then you also need to know, hey, you got hit in the arm. You got hit in the head, you got hit in the leg, that kind of stuff. Because that will be really important and play into the combat a lot. Okay, so you can see this guy just hit me in the... Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I got wrecked. Okay, so I got hit in the leg. Now I'm walking slower because my legs are damaged. Uh, if I can just get him in the leg while he's on the ground... And you can see he's moving slower now. Um, until he obviously recovers his temporary health. Oh, that was savage. So you can kind of see why this is important. So that you can tell where you've been hit and where they've hit you. So in terms of the, the damage mask system, which is what we're calling it. Oh, nice shot. That's about it. It is a really, really satisfying thing to whoop, play with. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm a gunner. I'm not going to go too deep in, you know, all the technicalities of how it works and how to actually set it up, because I may or may not do a tutorial in the future. Oh! <laughs> all right, screw it. Let's just finish him off. <laughs> oh, down we go. Now, on top of the damage mask, I've made some more visual upgrades to the game, as well as some really sneaky optimizations. So if you follow this game for any amount of time, you'll have heard me say that we don't use any color, you know, base color albedo textures, and that we only use normal maps to get all of our sort of texturing done. So with that in mind, I've actually started baking height maps into the blue channel of the normals. So you can see this is a height map. You know, the higher bits are here, the, the darker parts are darker. Um, and then the R and the G are just, you know, the normal map. And then we can just append uh, a blue value into that that's just flat. Um, now, it does make the normals slightly less bumpy looking, but you can just alter the bumpiness of the normal in the material. And then in our materials, we simply mask the R and G from the texture. We subtract 0 0.5 and multiply it by 2 because a normal map goes from negative one to one rather than zero to one like a regular texture does. So when you sample a normal map from a texture sample, it's automatically doing this anyway. Uh, and then we just append a one into the blue channel. So then it can be plugged into the normal, like normal, excuse the pun. And then with some of the foliage textures, we go even one step further and we have all four channels in use. So the R and the G is the normal map of the asset. Then the blue channel is a color mask. So it looks <laughs> looks absolutely ridiculous. But then the alpha is the actual alpha of the foliage. So you can see here, I've got, you know, a black and a white mask. And then I can use those values to say, hey, this should be this color, that should be that color. You know, if it's greater than 0 0.5, make it the leaf color. If it's less than 0 0.5, make it the stick color. And so altogether, we end up with something like this. So we've got normal map, we've got a color mask, and we've got the actual alpha mask all in one texture. So it probably seems like a little bit pedantic, but you think about this 
for every single asset in the game, even if it's just saving one texture sample per material, per draw call, blah, 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 it all really adds up in the end. So that was definitely worth it for us. And what we end up doing with the height map that I've embedded in these, you know, in these normals is things like mesh paint or blending between things or bump offset. So if I was to start, you know, painting on this mesh, um, you can see that it is using the height map in a height lerp. So it fills in the cracks first and then it, you know, covers the entire thing. So that can look super, super cool, super effective. And because I'm using the alpha of the vertex color to drive, you know, the change between textures, I can then use the R, G, and B to actually change the color of what we're painting on it. So this could be like, you know, render that's flaking off the bricks, or it could even be like moss or something that's creeping up, you know, the bottom of, of a tower. And the reason that I've done it this way is if we have a bunch of buildings that are all, you know, the same modular asset thing, we can spice them up to look completely different by having, you know, different colored paints on them uh, and different, you know, variations of this. That's really, really cool. And we were going to do that anyway, but now we can do it with just one texture sample. Not even just one texture sample multiple times, but one single texture sample. So that's super, super cool. So to go along with those texture optimizations, we have some new foliage in the game, uh, like these little saplings here that can kind of bend out of the way, which is, which is really nice. I've worked on making like a dense kind of forest floor setup so that you know, when you're in a forest, there's actually debris on the ground. We've got these leaves that can kind of get pushed out of the way a little bit, which is kind of nice. And all these like, you know, it's kind of just like sticks and twigs and stuff on the ground. But as well as the saplings and the, and the usual ferns and stuff, we've got these ones here, which are, you know, pretty nice. <laughs> I think a lot of people, they see the sort of art style of the game and they just assume it's like another low poly game at first glance. But it's sort of a, it's sort of a case of complexity through quantity and you know again these are completely interactive with the <laughs> with the blood system <laughs> so they will they will get weighed down by the blood and yeah i think this forest floor is really really nice really detailed um, but it still fits in with the rest of the sort of simplistic landscape and simplistic colors that i've chosen to go with now another really cool thing that i've added is this road spline system so this just draws to a runtime virtual texture it doesn't actually exist in the world but i've set up a ton of parameters on the side here and a few different materials so we've got different brick patterns one of my favorites is this road rocky material that i've got set up uh, and then i've got a bunch of parameters again using that texture optimization with the height map and the normal map in one where we can adjust the fall off of the road so that it kind of comes out of the ground gradually based on the height texture. So if we lower the contrast, you can see that, you know, it isn't as contrasty. <laughs> I like to have the contrast pretty high for most of these. Then I also have a slider that determines where dirt sort of creeps up the rocks. So we look really closely. You can see that this dirt is going up the height map, basically. And then we can also adjust the contrast of this here. So contrast bring that down and now the dirt softly blends into the color of the road so that's super cool that'll be really handy and the fact that it's using a spline system means that we can have actors actually follow roads and give roads greater priority than moving from one place to another and so last but not least by any means is a new base character for the game um, obviously, I've been using the ALS base model guy since day one. Uh, we've all grown to love and care for Anim Man, uh, as he is known. But like all mortals, his time must come to an end at some point. So I am pleased to introduce you to uh, un unnamed muscular faceless man. Uh, this is a model that is based on the female mannequin. The reason that I decided to base it upon this one rather than the, the male mannequin is because this is just a, a way more neutral figure. You know, it's, it's essentially androgynous, whereas the, the Unreal Engine standard mannequin just has like these huge, buffy, 
like muscle man shoulders that just it just he's like got a hunchback essentially so i chose the the female mannequin as the starting point just sort of stitched over all these segments then i remeshed it until it was just like this kind of blobby mess and then i carved out this uh very sensual muscular figure for the base character. Now, controversial opinion, or maybe it isn't if, you know, you're also a fellow game dev, I cannot be fucked with facial rigging or facial features, especially on a game that's played out here, you know, 80% of the time. Uh, I just thought there is no point doing a face. I know it kind of seems a little bit trendy to not put a face on your character at the moment, but I think that's for a very good reason most of the time. <laughs> so, we will be dealing with faceless characters. Uh, they will have like, you know, hair and eyebrows and mustaches and beards and stuff. Uh, they just won't have eyes or a nose or a mouth. I'd rather have no face at all than to have a bad face or to have bad facial rigging or bad lip syncing and that kind of thing. It's, it's like in real life, it's better to not do something than to just half ass it. So that's sort of my reasoning for the, uh, the lack of a face on the character. Now I have started making a low poly version of this sculpt. I'm yet to do the hands. Uh, I guess the hands will be a little bit more difficult because they actually deform, you know, at the fingers. And then for the ears, I just thought, you know, fuck it. We're just gonna tack on a decimated version of the ear. Just because the ear doesn't actually need to deform like an arm or an elbow or anything does. And then the next step after I've, you know, retopologized the, the low poly character is to get the difference between the low poly and the high poly sculpt and bake that into a normal map. So then we end up with a thousand vertices of a character model, but it retains all of this nice sculpted body definition that I put about three days of work into. <laughs> Might seem a little bit overkill, you know, to have this kind of detail in a game that's played out here with a cell shader. But this was like, you know, my first actual crack at using Blender and my very first time sculpting stuff. So I figured it, you know, I'll take it as a learning experience and I'll, I'll go the full hog, make it a bit more defined. And I think, you know, it will actually show up in game pretty well. So that's the new base character model. And, you know, it is, it's a sad day, but it is time to say goodbye to Anime Man. And the next Prismatica devlog that we do, it'll be a new era, a new season of devlogs. And it will be led by this androgynous, ripped, humanoid figure. So that wraps it up for this devlog. There is a lot going on behind the scenes that we can't really show yet. So I hope you're really excited for the next devlog. And if you would like to support the development of this project monetarily, you can check out our Patreon in the description below. So with that, <laughs> I say goodbye. Goodbye.